This conference will now be recorded. All right. So we're in Hebrews, and two weeks ago, or a couple of weeks ago in church, I talked about Abraham and uh, how Abraham was called and that he showed his, it was by faith that he went and followed where God was going. So what we're going to talk about today is in Hebrews, and it's a little bit past that part, but this is also about Abraham. So I thought that we'd talk about Abraham two weeks ago, and we'll talk about Abraham today. So this is going to be in Hebrews. It's going to be in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, uh, verses 17 and 19. So Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. And um, I'm, I'll read it in two different uh, translations, and then uh, as I read it and as y'all read it on your phones, just think about things that stand out to you about it, uh, any questions you have, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look back in Genesis 22 and read the whole story of what this is about um, and what Abraham did when this was happening, because this is a this is a tough, tough uh, part of scripture, I think. Uh, it's really, really hard to understand, I think. So, but here it is, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God would be able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. So I'll read it in another translation. This is the ESV station uh, translation. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So that's the text today. And uh, and this is, I don't know if y'all are familiar with in Genesis chapter 22 of the story. Um, where God uh, commands, uh, tells Abraham to offer his son up as a sacrifice um, uh, to him. And uh, so it's a really weird story because, you know, you remember it, Abraham, we first hear about Abraham in the very end of chapter 11 in Genesis. And then we hear about the calling, and this is what we talked about in church uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, that he was called to go, and he was the first one when God started his redemption plan back for all of his creation. Abraham was the first one. He was the first person that God called back, and um, and then we have all of this long history from from Genesis 12 to Genesis 22 of these experiences of uh, God being faithful and having a relationship uh, with Abraham and and blessing him with this son, Isaac, and uh, all this stuff that had been going on. And it's just a, it's a weird story, um, I think. Uh, so I'm going to read it to you right now. So this is in Genesis 22, and it's going to be uh, verses 1 through 18 in Genesis 22. And I'm going to only read it once, but I'll read it slow so you all can think about it. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moria. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on which, on one of the mountains which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. 
the boy and I will travel a little further and we will worship there and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them walked on together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an off altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you are that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by his, his horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named, named the place Yahweh Yirweh, Yirah, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number, like the stars in the sky and the sand of, on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. So there, there's the story. Have you all heard that story before? That's a difficult story, isn't it? I mean, what stands out to that story in that story, y'all? What what stands out? What questions do you have? What's curious about it um, when you think about that story in Genesis 22? My first thought is, did his wife know that this was happening? <laughs> <laughs> so Jody's first thought is, did his wife know this was happening? Or did he sneak off? <laughs> I'll be right back, you know? She, she didn't know. I don't know if she knew or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was probably some artistic uh, liberty that they took when they made that movie because the text doesn't say that she knew, but you would think that she would. You know, she probably sleeps in the same room as Abraham, or the same tent, and when they. When the Lord comes and tells him this, I'm sure she was there. She heard it. You know, you would think, but but we don't know for sure. But yeah, where's the wife when all this is going on? Her age, she might not could hear. Right? Yeah, her age, she might not <laughs> could hear. Nancy says something here. Let me see what Nancy says. Um, Nancy says, when I was a child hearing this story, I was so afraid of the possibilities my parents being asked to sacrifice me as a child. And then she puts LOL. But I got to admit, when I heard this story as a kid, it really freaked me out. And even as an adult, I would go, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think I could do that, you know? And I'm, even right now, I, I couldn't do it. I'll be very honest to you. I'll say that, that I can't do it. So I agree. I agree. It, it's a weird story. It really is. So we're going to look at it a little bit more. What else stands out to y'all as y'all um, as y'all think about that story? What kind of stands out to me is like it says, because of your faith, your descendants will prosper. 
Yeah. What if I did something wrong and then my descendants have to pay for it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think this goes back to Genesis Genesis twelve one through three when he calls him and he says, "You will be blessed to be a blessing," and this is where God is reaffirming that but your people will your descendants will be a blessing to the earth. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. So, and and I think Jesus makes it real clear in the New Testament that, you know, if we do something wrong, our kids aren't going to suffer. If we do something right, our kids might have a better life just because we help them in that way. But he, God's not going to do something just because of what we did. There might be natural consequences on our actions, but I don't think God's going to look down. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. One of the things that stands out to me is because if you read the rest of Scripture and you read the rest of the Bible, God does not like people to offer their children as sacrifices to God. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the things that he really disliked about the people that worshipped Baal mm -hmm. and Moloch because they would offer their sacrifices up. And even in uh, Jeremiah, he says, you shall not offer your kids a sacrifice. Granted, this is in Genesis 22. This is before all this. But as we look back, we know God's heart about that. And that's something that he despises, that he hates, that he doesn't want. So in, in part, that gives me comfort knowing that God's heart doesn't change. Um, so if he hated the people when they offered sacrifices to Baal and to Moloch of their children, and he said in Jeremiah not to do it, then I think, I would think that we know enough about God that that Abraham was right in this Hebrews text that even if he was going to die, he was going to raise him back to life or, or that he didn't believe that he was going to really have, that God was going to provide that sacrifice because it, it really is strange. Um, so, man, there's a lot to talk about in this and we've got about, 15 minutes left so we'll, we'll talk about it as much as we can but um the first thing it says that stands out to me is in in chapter in verse one god tested abraham's faith god tested his faith and, and what what does that mean um I, you know i think that that god probably still tests us at times um, I don't think he tests us in ways where he asks us to give up our child uh, to, to do anything like that. But I do think that we are tested and God just says, I wonder how he'll reply or he'll respond in this circumstance. But I also think that the testing in this came after Abraham had a very long history with God. I mean, he had been through a lot. He had been through decades of trusting and waiting on God to give him this kid. He he went through the whole thing with his nephew Lot being in Sodom and him being able to go save his nephew and, and him saying, but God, what if I find 50 righteous people? Will you destroy it? No. What about 40? No. What about 30? No. 20? No. 10? No, I won't do it if even, you know, so, so. I think Abraham's faith had grown uh, over these past decades of the time that had gone. So I do think, I don't think God, God would ever do this to somebody that's a brand new Christian, you know, uh, or a brand new follower or something. I think he just, uh, he did it in this circumstance to father Abraham uh, in a way just to, just to see. And, um, to see if he really was willing to do it. And um, so that's uh, that's something that I don't know if I'm real comfortable with that, to be honest with you, you know. Uh, but, uh, but I also trust in who God is, and I trust in how God's respond, re revealed himself to me. And I would pray that if a situation ever came up where I was being tested, that I would be able to, to respond in the right way. Um, so he tested him. Um, so, so, and, and in a test, it's, are you going to get the answer right? You know, so it's almost like, 
would you really be willing to do it or would you not be willing to do it? So I think God would have stopped him, you know, I mean, cl clearly he did stop him. Uh, and if he wouldn't have been willing to do it, he wouldn't have had to stop him. But Barbara, were you about to say something? Abraham knew that he wouldn't stop it because it, in verse five, it says, we will work total service. We will go, we will worship and we will come back. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he knew. Yeah. That's it. I think Barbara hit on a big key to this. In verse five, it says, uh, stay here with the donkeys, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. Then we will come right back. So, so in, in, in Hebrews, when we look at the text that we looked at to start this, it says that, that Abraham believed that even if his son died, that God would raise him back. And figuratively, he did raise him back. That's what it says in Hebrews. So I like that Hebrews sheds a little light on the, the story that we don't read in verse 22, in chapter 22 in Genesis. But we can pick up that he did believe. And as they were walking down or walking up the mountain, uh, Isaac said, hey, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And, and Abraham says, God will provide. God will provide the sacrifice. So. But OK, so. But still, I mean, Abraham was was confident. He said, we're going to go worship. We're going to come back down. God will provide the sacrifice. But still, he was obedient. He tied his kid's hand up. He bound his feet. He put him up on the altar. He picked the knife up. And, you know, he's like, I'm pretty sure I believe that we'll come back down. I'm pretty sure that God's going to provide this lamb. But. I'm going to keep doing what he's told me to do until until he is he does what I believe that he's going to do. Um, so so one of the things that stood out to me when I was preparing for this this past week um, that I had really never noticed before that I wanted to bring up to y'all um, and go to the land of Moria. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Uh, and then a little bit later, he takes the servants off. And then on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. So God comes to Abraham at night, tells him what to do. So I'm sure Abraham was up all night thinking about it. If his wife was there to hear it, they were probably having conversations about this. They get up the next morning, they get the two servants, they pack up, he gets Isaac, they talk, they start going. And they travel three days, just the four of them for three days. And I can't imagine, is it two days? I just saw you say two. On the third day of their journey. What were you saying? We're talking about three. Oh yeah, I heard you discussing. But on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up. So they traveled two whole days. And then on the third day, they look up. So for two solid days and part of that third one, they're walking along. So as I was contemplating this this week, what are the Abraham has to be thinking about this as he's walking to Moria. He has to be thinking about it. And in his mind, I think he's going, OK, God has been faithful. God has been good. God promised me this son. God said that there would be descendants from this son. And, and he was, and I think that as he was going, he was probably telling Isaac, reaffirming Isaac, the history, you know, hey, man, you're a miracle kid. You know, you know how old your mom is? Uh, you know, and probably hadn't noticed this, but your mom's a lot older than everybody else's mom around here, you know, and I'm pretty old. I'm an old man too. And, and you're a miracle. And God came and your mom laughed. Your mom laughed when God told her that you were going to be born. And, and I laughed too. And But you're here and your name means laughter. And so I think that for two days, I think Abraham and Isaac were probably having this conversation of Abraham was reassuring himself about the goodness of God and how faithful God had been in his life. And he was reassuring his son because it blows my mind that that Isaac just goes okay tie me up put me on the it doesn't say anything that Isaac 
asked why. Isaac argued. Isaac tried to run away, and Abraham tackled him. You know, Isaac yells, no, no, God, no, Abraham, no, don't do that, Daddy, don't do that. You didn't say anything about that, but Abraham, he, you know, so I think in those two days, I think Abraham reminded himself so much of the goodness and the relationship that he had over the past decades with God that he fully trusted him. He fully trusted him. And then as they're walking up the hill, they got to get up there and they're, he has to build an altar. I mean, he puts a stone, another stone. That had to take an hour or more to build, to stack stones up high enough and then to put the wood on there and then to put his kid, you know, and the whole time he's like, okay, where's that lamb? God, show up, show up, show up. But it was by faith that he offered his son Isaac as a, as a sacrifice to God. And um, he kept going. Um, we got about five and a half, 10 minutes, maybe. Uh, there's a lot that I can't talk about all of it, but Moria, Moria is, is uh, at that time there, Moria was a region and it really wasn't highly, highly um, developed in cities and stuff there. Um, but later uh, when David was there, he goes to a place there and he founds a city and it is called Jerusalem. And uh, so Moria is in a very close proximity to Jerusalem. And, uh, and we'll talk more about that probably next week. But that's very interesting uh, that it was Jerusalem. Okay. So uh, I'm afraid. Okay. So uh, some things that, some points that I want to make. The first, well, any other questions or things that stand out to y'all in this text? Because the last part, I'm just going to have to save it till next week because it's going to take me, you know, 15 minutes to, to go through that. But um, anything, any other questions or things that stand out to y'all on that? You know, why did the servants have to go is what Kendrick said. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe to take care of them or to cook for them or to, it was a three day journey. Maybe they had a lot of stuff to carry and they took care of setting the tents up and yeah, I guess that's all I could think is that, you know, when you're somebody like Abraham and have as big a operation as he did, I guess he went everywhere with the servants. So, but they didn't go up on the mountain. They stayed down at the bottom. They stayed down at the bottom. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about was, um, so the angel, it doesn't say that God says this, but it says that the angel um, so God called him and told him to go do this, right? But when it gets to where the knife is lifted up, it says that the angel of the Lord called out and said, Abraham, Abraham. I find that interesting that God sent his, his servant, an angel, to go and to be his messenger here. And, and I didn't really start thinking about this until this past week either. Abraham heard that. Abraham, Abraham, stop. And I want to read to you again what this says, what it says. Then the angel of the Lord called to eight, called again to Abraham. After he said, Abraham, Abraham, stop, don't, don't harm, uh, don't, don't sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Um, and it says, this is what he says right after that. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you and multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. So I always thought about Abraham hearing that. But Isaac, who was laying on that, he was a young, he was 12, 13 years old. Who else how old he was? But Isaac, who was laying on that thing, looking at the knife, the knife's coming down and he hears, Abraham, Abraham, stop. And then Isaac is there, there to hear this promise 
your descendants, Abraham, which is Isaac. So essentially, the angel of the Lord is telling Isaac, Isaac, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand of the sea. And, and I think that this experience with Isaac hearing the angel come and do this miraculous thing, this, this thing, um, that that probably was very foundational in Isaac's faith. I think just as Abraham explained his past to Isaac as they were going and explaining how you're a miracle baby, your mom's too old, I'm too old, you know, God called me and I left, you know, Mora to come here and da da, you know, all this stuff. I think now Isaac would be able to tell his kids, well, there was a time that your granddad was about to sacrifice me and an angel came and said, stop, don't do that. And, and I think that this became a part of their faith story that became probably a very big part of Isaac's faith story, too, that he passed down to Jacob. And then, of course, Jacob tried passed down to the 12. And then it's it, so, so often our faith is based on the faith of somebody else. You know, I think I think faith originates uh, from God. And what God has done in other people's lives. And so often we see the faith of somebody else. And that gives us the courage to have faith as well. And um, so I think that's one of the things that happened right here with Isaac. Um, let me see. Uh, okay, it's after 7 o'clock. Um, last thing I'm going to say, and I think I've said that twice now. But last thing I'm going to say is that... In Scripture, um, very often in the Old Testament, and I think when we've talked about the sacrificial system before, um, I've shared this before, but sometimes in the Old Testament, whoops, <laughs> sometimes in the Old Testament, God does something uh, in miniature that is going to reveal something bigger uh, in, in the New Testament, like the covenant that he made with Moses on Mount Sinai. That was the, the first covenant uh, on how to offer sacrifices and the law and everything like that. And that was a, a smaller version of the greater covenant that Jesus came to do uh, when he poured out his blood for the new covenant. And the sacrificial uh, or the, the Passover lamb and uh, when Moses was delivering the people out of Egypt and the Passover lamb was slain so that the people could be delivered from captivity and slavery uh, and to go to the promised land. So those 300,000 people or whatever that were a million people, whatever it was, uh, that they could be set free. And then Jesus comes. He's the Passover lamb that's slain to 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 free everybody of captivity and slavery to sin and, and all that. Um, there's another time that in the book of Hosea, if you're familiar with the book of Hosea, in the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea to go to marry a prostitute to symbolize the relationship. And Hosea loved Gomer, but Gomer kept cheating on him and sleeping with other men and leaving him and all this stuff. But God had that happen to, as a small way to illustrate what the nation of Israel was doing to God. God loves them, but he keep, they kept leaving him and cheating on him. and doing. So in Scripture, there's this, there's this I, prophetic idea that God does something in the smaller to point to something in the bigger. And what we're going to talk about next week is the bigger and I think when we go back and think about this between now and next week, when you, you compare um, Isaac to Jesus and this story of Isaac and then the story of Jesus, and um, I think that this story of Isaac, the only son, being offered as a sacrifice, and you look at a lot of the stuff in this story, it's very similar to Jesus. And uh, I have about eight points that I'll bring up next week that we'll talk about each one of those and, and go there. But 
Um, it's five after seven. Does anybody have any other last questions or last comments or? Does it say how old Isaac was? It does not say, but I would assume nine to 13 years old, somewhere around there. You know, the movie, he was about 13, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I've watched a, I watched a cartoon version of this for children's church and he looked like he was about 12 or 13. So, so I don't know. I, I could probably try to research that and see, see if we know, but I don't know. Because it says in verse one, it just says sometime later um, after Isaac was born, sometime later. So we really, I can probably go ahead and say we don't know. Any other questions? All right. It's a weird story. But I think that when you look at the relationship that God had with Abraham and you look that this was pointing to something bigger and you look at the fact that God's heart throughout scripture is against doing stuff like this and uh, in the context of it being a test that um, that I think we can have some peace in there. And Nancy, you don't have to be scared that your parents are going to ask you to sacrifice. Ask <laughs> But I agree with you, Nancy. When I heard it when I was a kid, it freaked me out too. So, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and shut it down and, and we'll finish the rest of the story next week, okay? And uh, Nancy, it's good seeing you or hearing from you.